Today we're talking about a topic that uh, it seems like I speak on a lot. Um, it's about dysfunction, uh, dysfunctional families, and our personal lives and dysfunction. So today, before we start, uh, I want you to be self-aware, if you would, please, as I have to be self-aware. Um, I want you to be honest, whether it's your immediate family or your family that you came from, raise your hand if your family would be considered dysfunctional. Everybody has two hands up, their feet are up in the air. All of us have dysfunction. There is no normality. We all can look at our life and say, I want it to be better. But we could talk sermons after sermons after sermons about how to be godly. But until we deal with our reality of our home, of my life, of my, disacts, my distractions and my dysfunctions, we are never going to do what God wants us to do. We all have dysfunction. I was in counseling today, or this week, and somebody said something to me that, that told me that they had no idea who I was. They said, Bruce, I know that you being a pastor, you don't understand my dysfunction. <laughs> and if you've been around here very long, you know that I understand dysfunction. So I want to give you a recap. That just because your family has dysfunction, it doesn't mean you have to stay in that dysfunction. There has to be a point in your life where you realize who you are, but who you are is not defined by who you came from. We have to understand that today can be a new day. Today, just look in your past, you cannot be defined by where you came from. I understand dysfunction. I understand dysfunction quite well. I remember the first time my family was in chaos, my brother, I'm the baby of eight, so that's dysfunction in its own right. My parents were too tired to mess with me. They said, just do whatever you want to do. So, of course, I did. Um, but I remember very early on, I was in junior high, and I came home, and uh, the police were all at my house. And uh, <laughs> what's going on here? And my brother uh, went next door to my house with a baseball bat and hit the mother of my next door neighbor in the head and uh, almost killed her. And he took this baseball bat and threw it in a pond that was in the back of our house. And the cops came and, and arrested my brother for attempted murder. Um, and he was in Hatchison, Kansas for years until he turned 21 years old. Just two years after that, my brother that was older than him raped a girl in my high school. And this is a town of Wamego, Kansas of 3,000 people. Could you imagine trying to get a date and your last name's Thomas after your brother did that? One brother tried to commit, kill somebody and the other brother raped somebody. That's pretty dysfunctional. And then my next brother tried to commit suicide and was ultimately murdered. My dad was put in prison for embezzlement. But I don't understand dysfunction, do I? I am the poster child for dysfunction. And there has to be a choice that we make. Would my pedigree say that I should be your pastor? You would say, if I knew that, I wouldn't be coming to church here. But it doesn't define us. I want to tell you that every one of us has dysfunction. But the dysfunction that we have, we have to rise above that. And the only way that we can rise above that is to be self-aware and saying, I don't have to be in dysfunction. I can rise above the dysfunction. But we all have dysfunction within our life. And I want to give to you a, a couple of things. This is going to be a counseling session slash sermon, so it wants to be very applicable to you. Because when I get done today, I'm going to ask you to make a decision to not allow the dysfunction of your past to continue in your life today. And there has to be a decision within your life of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. There's eight rules of a dysfunctional family. And I want, this may fit you and it may not. You may walk out of me as soon as you hear these eight dysfunctions, but it is, it is so true. Everyone has to be in control of their feelings. 
No crying is allowed. You must always smile and laugh. No one can show you any emotion that lets anyone think there's anything wrong. In other words, the idea of you having a problem, you have to put the mask on. You can have dysfunction in your home, but as soon as you walk out of that home, that mask is on, and you do not let anybody know there's a problem. Everyone in the family is always right. If anyone in the family is always right, then you feel the need to prove others wrong. If everybody has to be right and you fight for it, what happens is your home becomes a home built on eggshells. And you know what happens? You don't want to crack an eggshell, so you walk very lightly. Because if you walk up very loudly and you make somebody upset, it ruins the life. You cannot blame yourself for your own problems. It's always someone else's fault. Somebody give me an amen to that. And if I would say in your, if your marriage, if you have to say I'm sorry all the time, it's a one-sided relationship. Because I am sorry should go both ways a lot. Because no one is perfect in that relationship. No one is allowed to express their feelings, thoughts, wants, or wishes. No one can express it. it but five goes with number four. If you try to be honest about your feelings, thoughts, wants, or wishes, everyone in the family shoots them down to make themselves feel better. That's the same thing as a bully would do. But six, everyone must pretend that there are no problems at home. When you are around others, you must keep up the myth that we all have it all together. But listen to this last one. Just live by this motto. If I don't trust anyone, I'll never be disappointed. And that goes on with dysfunction. And that's why our homes are in disarray because there's no trust and no loyalty because I'm afraid to get hurt. Which causes very chaotic homes, messy homes. If you don't make the time to work on create the life that you want, you're going to be forced to spend a lot of time dealing with the life that you didn't want. And we spend so much time dealing with the problems because I didn't deal with something early. I'm dealing with chaos now, and I don't know how to get out of the chaos that I'm in. Dysfunction is not normal. Disf there are no functional houses that are perfect. I could look at you, and you could look at me, and I could go to counseling, and I would say, if you do this, this, and this, and this, and I could look at your life, and I could pick out the dysfunction in your life all day long. And you could do that to mine. But today what I'm asking you to do is not look at my dysfunction or not look at others' dysfunction. I'm saying let's look at our own dysfunction. And let's be very self-aware of who I am. Now, the only place that we can turn to is the Bible for this. And let me tell you, the Bible is absolutely packed full of dysfunctional families absolutely packful. So when I talk about dysfunction, I'm not saying you are the worst person in the world, that your family is the worst person in the world. I'm saying the Bible is jam-packed full of dysfunction. But what we do with that dysfunction is what counts. Are we satisfied with that dysfunction? Are we saying, this is all I know? And if I live in chaos, that's all I know, that's all I'll do, and that's what our kids will end up doing, and it's going to be a domino effect all the way down to our kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids' life. There has to be a time where we say no. There has to be a time where we say, I draw the line in the sand. There has to be a time where we deal with our dysfunction. Let me tell you the first dysfunctional family in the Bible. Do you know who they are? Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel. They walked with God, and they were dysfunctional. <laughs> we're above the bottom line already, aren't we? And then Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah. They had Esau and Jacob, who we're going to talk about today. And then we had Jacob and Joseph. And finally, at the end of that chaos, Joseph said, No, I am going to flee I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to be honorable in every area of our life. But in the book of Genesis, Isaac and Rebekah's family exhibited the multiple examples of dysfunction that affected generations. They formed family coalitions. And I want to talk about what those family coalitions would be. I want to start with one verse. And see if you could pick out the, the coalition 
against family unity in one verse. And it's found in Genesis chapter 25, verse 27 and 28. It's talking about Esau and Jacob, which Justin made us a little backdrop over here. It says, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Did you get the big but right there? But Rebekah loved Jacob. There was a division within the home. What we need to do is understand that there can't be division within the home. I want to give you some ideas of what a dysfunctional family looks like and what we need to do about that dysfunction. We all understand I'm not talking to anybody individually. This church is a dysfunctional church. Your pastor is a dysfunctional pastor, and you are a dysfunctional family. So when we look at that, it's not like I'm pointing at anybody because before I can point at you, I have to point at me. And I want to share that openly. So the first thing is, is what they did. They showed favoritism. They showed favoritism. Who was the favorite child in your home? You look growing up, you would probably say, well, I think my sister was the favorite child. Or I think my brother was the favorite child. And you can point out because mom let her do that, mom let them do this. And I'm going to be honest with you, my family thinks I was the favorite child. I was the baby of eight. My brother was graduated from high school before I was even born. My mom and dad were so tired of discipline after, after all the chaos. They just, do your thing. So my mom and dad gave me the freedom. So my brothers and sisters think, they just loved you the most because you never got in trouble. I said, oh, I got in trouble just by not mom and dad. <laughs> That's for sure. So, so who is the favorite in your, child, in your childhood? And when you say that, we have to understand that when we grow up our kids, when we see our kids and our grandkids, there cannot be favoritism within our kids. Because once there's favoritism, train up our children, then what happens is the other kids understand that mom treats them or dad treats them better, and it causes chaos in the home. But favoritism. In Genesis chapter 25, verses 21, it says this, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Conceived. She was barren, and... and, and and Isaac just said, Lord, please give to me a child. Give to me a child. And he did that. And the names were Jacob and Esau. If we don't deal with the dysfunction, we pass down the future generations. And that's exactly what Isaac and Rebekah did to Jacob and Esau. They had dysfunction within their home because of the favoritism, because of what's going on. And they passed that down. The second thing after favoritism is deception. We could call that the elephant in the room. The lie that we have to hide. We all have our family issues. We all say, well, you know, we could talk about it at home, but we don't talk about it in public. Because it is the elephant in the room. It's the stuff that we sweep under the carpet. It's the stuff that we know about, but it's just awkward to talk about. And when we have those things that are awkward to talk about, our little family secrets, then it causes chaos. And because the family secrets start when a kid is young, guess what the students and the kids learn? They learn how to sweep stuff under the carpet. And because mom and dad have dysfunction or because grandparents have dysfunction, they've learned the dysfunction, they learned the chaos. So what they are very good to do is lift up the carpet and sweep under the carpet and put the carpet down and hope nobody sees the dirt under the carpet. But guess what that is? It's called dysfunction. So what we have to do is we have to be honest about the deception. See, Isaac and Rebekah had some deception. They had deception. In Genesis chapter 26, God pleaded with them and said, Okay, listen, in uh, verse 26, Now there was a famine in the land. Besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Amalek, king of the Philistines of Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. 
dwell in this land, and the Bible says, I will be with you. Now, if you heard from God, and he says, I want you to do something, and I will be with you. Wow, that's power. I will bless you. I will keep you. I will be with you. But the Bible says they dwelt in the land as a foreigner, but Isaac got scared. He got scared of the men because Rebekah was a beautiful woman. And he was scared that they were going to kill him to get to Rebekah. So Isaac told everyone that Rebekah was my sister instead of my wife. So the boys grew up knowing that Isaac and Rebekah were married. That's mom and dad. But to everybody else, that was brother and sister. So they had to live a lie. They had to go to school and say, that's my sister, or that's, that's, that's my dad and my sister, not mom and dad. So they learned how to live in a lie. And when you live in a lie, you have secrets. And sometimes those secrets can go overwhelming. And imagine knowing that your kids have to lie because of your lie. Knowing that that lie is going to domino. And because of deception, we teach our kids and we allow the chaos to live within our lives because we're not willing to deal with the truth. So how do you deal with the truth? Why do you live a lie? Why are you one person one way and another person one way? I truly believe to deal with the chaos in our home, there cannot be any deception. If there's something that we have to talk about, we have to put our big boy panties on and we have to talk about it. Amen? If we are lying and we are hiding and we're not being honest with our spouse and with our kids, it's time for a family meeting. Because anytime there's deception, anytime there's chaos, there is no happiness. And our homes are like eggshells and our eggshells will crack and there will be no hope, there will be no happiness, and there will be no future within our homes until we get rid of the deception that we have. Maybe the deception is finances. Maybe it's our marriage. Maybe it's our kids. What does our family look like? Do we even know what our family looks like? It causes major dysfunction. And sometimes dads go to work and they never come home. And sometimes mom's trying to take care of everything and there's a, there's a strife between that and our kids are not happy. And we live in a home. We call that cohabitation. We live in the same home, but we're not mom and we're not dad. We're not husband. We're not wife. And we're not parents. And what happens is we become so used to the chaos because of distractions. But after that, we have control. Now, I'm going to step on some toes here. If you are the dominant role that our mother and our father and our kids have no say because they're scared about everything that takes place within their home, that is Dysfunction. Everybody in our home should be able to talk without fear. Control is one of the both parents and spouses make decisions for the other that are unnecessary. Control means my decision is better than your decision. My action is right and your action is wrong. You do what I tell you to do, when I tell you to do it, and how I tell you to do it, and then you'll be okay. But guess what happens in most marriages? And I say this a lot. If it's my way or the highway, guess what most people pick? The highway. But what happens in synergy in a home? Honey, what do you think about this? Well, <laughs> you're, you're, you're asking me? I, you've never asked me before. You've always just done what you've wanted to do. But what about the cohesiveness in a home, when we have a family meeting, we say, guys, this is what I'm thinking about. This is what I'd like to do. What do you guys think about this? And we bring in cohesiveness within the home. What happens is the eggshells go away because control is not in charge. So what happens? We start talking. Whoa, you mean communication? You mean we actually talk about things? We make crazy decisions and wonder why the kids make crazy decisions after they leave. Because of control. I make every decision. And let me, I, I think I'm a very smart guy. 
But some of my decisions are very stupid. Somebody give me an amen. I wish I made right choices all the time. I have to kick myself in the booty all the time at the stupid decisions I make. So that's why we have to have people to balance us out. It's not always my way or the highway. It's our way. It has to be the way that we go. And I love this verse in Ephesians chapter 6. And, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. This doesn't mean you control them. It means you train them. And once you train them, we have to guard them, but we have to let them make some decisions. But keep them close enough that you can protect them in their decisions. But moms and dads that are in complete control of everything that takes place within the home, those kids are going to be dysfunctional because they will not have an idea how to live their life. So we can't be so controlling. The fourth thing is the inability, you ready for this? The inability to resolve, what's that word? Conflict. Anybody like conflict? Woohoo! Let's get in a fight right now. Nobody likes conflict. The problem is that if we hide from the conflict, we have unresolved conflict. And that's just picking the rug up and sweeping more dust under the rug. And sooner or later, that conflict that was so small at the start becomes the elephant in the room that nobody can talk about. And that conflict becomes overbearing. Conflict is normal in a family relationship. If you aren't having conflict, then you're probably not doing something right. A lot of you would say that you're doing a lot right then, right? Because we have a lot of conflict. Now, I love doing premarital counseling, and, and uh, I have some people here that I did premarital counseling with. And, and then one of the things I said, give me the last big fight that you've had. Oh, we have never had a fight. <laughs> I said, you're not ready for marriage then, buddy. Because if you don't learn how to fight, you're not going to make it. So what I do in counseling, I say, I say, well, let me start a fight with you then. Because I truly believe that if you're scared of conflict, you will never resolve a major issue. And folks, marriage, there will be major issues. Somebody give me an amen. amen. Or you're dead or you're lying. One of the two. Because we have to be able to resolve conflict. And so often, once there's a conflict, once there's something that I'm afraid of, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt your feelings, I'm afraid you're going to do something, we stay on the very superficial, the very minimum line of communication. Because if I get to the point where I have to talk about conflict, somebody either gets mad or shuts down. And I can't deal with somebody that gets mad over the top nor can I communicate with somebody that shuts down. But what I have to learn how to do is to resolve that conflict. And how we resolve that conflict is both of us need to grow up and mature up. So, so I got a amen out of that. But isn't that true? I, I, I don't know where you are in your marriage relationship and in your family relationship. But when there's a conflict, you're not going to win every time. Nor should you win every time. But when there's a conflict, we say, this is how I feel. Not this is what you did. This is how I feel. There's nothing wrong with feelings. We all have feelings. But if we say, you did this to me, and this is what you're doing wrong, and if you would ever stop doing that, what happens is the, 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 it just gets enormously. It just gets us over the top. And then we fight aggression with aggression. But if you love somebody... This is how you made me feel. You hurt me when you said this. And I know it's not ma very masculine to say, you hurt me. But guys, we're very emotional too. We hide our emotion, but we're very emotional. And when we are hurt, we are hurt. And what we usually do is flip the switch or we shut down or we go out where guys go. I don't know where guys go, but they go do something. And they come back and they pout. Or they go to work in the garage because they're not willing to communicate because mom or wife or husband or father said something or did something that hurt their feelings. So what we have to do is we have to be able to resolve conflict. And how we resolve conflict is very simple. It's talk. 
Not get mad. Not raise your tone. But do, <laughs> say this funny, but do what you did before you got married. Remember talking on the phone without saying a word for 15 minutes? <laughs> oh, I just love being in your presence. <laughs> now, what are you going to say? Just talk to me. I got, I got a football game to watch, okay? Let's, let's get this thing over with. But when we're resolving conflict, it's, it's no distractions. Turn the TV off and talk. Because if we do not talk, our marriages, our kids, our grandkids are going to deja vu exactly what we've done because that's what they've seen us in. So we have to be able to resolve conflict. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath because it would give a place for the devil. Um, conflict resolution is a place for the devil. When you get mad and you do sin and you go pout and you don't talk to each other for three or four days or, or somebody leaves and you go do stuff and, and what happens is Satan gets in and he gets in thinking with doubt and fears and anxieties and it starts domino and effect and then all of a sudden that bitterness and that resentment comes in and what we have to do is we can't give a place to the devil. Let any unwholesome speech come out of your mouth. What we have to do is we have to love each other. <coughs> so we have to have conflict resolution. The fifth thing is broken relationships. The easiest way to take care of a broken relationship is just cut them out. Throw them away. They hurt me. They said something, they did something yesterday, last year, or five years ago. I'm just going to throw them away. And you know why that is? It's because we live in a throwaway society, don't we? Buy a TV. You don't get a TV fixed anymore, do you? TV breaks down, what do you do? Throw in the trash, go get another $299 50-inch screen. Kids break a bike. My dad would turn that bike over, and he'd spend 20 minutes trying to fix that bike. Nowadays, that bike's broke. We throw it away and get you another bike. We live in a throwaway society because everything is easy. Everything is cheap. And sometimes that's how we handle our homes. Because it takes work to raise kids. It takes work to have a good home. To have a good spouse. It takes work. So sometimes we look at broken relationships. And we think, let me just get this over with. And we throw this relationship to the curb. It's easier to deal with loneliness alone than loneliness with somebody else. And what we have to do is we have to not throw it, throw it away. When Esau was 40 years old, he went into his father Isaac and he said, it's time for my blessing. And Isaac said, you go out and you get me some game and you prepare it and you give it to me. And when I eat, the game that you prepared for me, I'll give you my blessing. But Rebecca heard what Isaac said to Esau. So Rebecca's favorite is Jacob, right? So Jacob comes up to Rebecca and Rebecca says this, said, I heard what your father said to Esau. So I need you to go out to the cattle. I need you to get a couple goats and bring them to me because Esau is going to get the birthright and you're more special than Esau. And I want you to get the birthright from Isaac. So he went out and got some goats and, and she prepared the goats and, and Esau was a fair man. Uh, Esau was a hunter. He was a red man. Esau means red. Hairy red. So he, his nickname would be, hey red, you know any reds? Anybody know, hey red, how you doing? Esau's nickname would be red. And Jacob was tender. He lived in tents. He was inside. He, he stayed inside. And Rebecca said, I'm going to take the goat and I'm going to put it on the back of your neck and I'm going to put it on your arms. Isaac is blind. He's old. He won't be able to see you, but he will feel you. So Jacob went into, into Isaac's room and Isaac said, who is this? And Jacob said, I am Esau. Bold face lie. And Isaac said, come to me. He said, you don't sound like Esau. 
So he reached down and touched his neck. But you feel like Esau. You smell like Esau because you're wearing some of his clothes. Although he thought it was not Esau, but he allowed his trust and the manipulation of his wife to give Jacob the birthright that Esau had. A broken relationship is when you do something wrong to get something you should not have. It causes chaos in the home. And it starts with Rebekah and Isaac. And it came down to Jacob and Esau. And after Esau heard what Jacob did, Esau said, I may be mourning right now, but when I get done mourning, I am going to kill you, Jacob. I'm going to kill you. Pain. Can you feel what they went through? The chaos, the dysfunction within the home? Sometimes we have broken relationships because of lies. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to say, what does the Bible say I should do? And we can allow the chaos to go through. So we have all admitted we all have chaos, right? So let me give you what does a functional family look like? And I, I, don't, I don't know what a functional family looks like. W what is normal, right? There is no normality. We don't know what that is. I call it a good enough family. What does a good enough family look like? Let me give you some ideas. Good enough families are loved. Are loved. Now, moms and dads, what we have to do is we have to love our kids as much as we love ourselves. We have to do for our kids as much as we do for ourselves. I believe we should be the leaders. I believe we should stand up and we should train, equip, and do the things we need to do. But our kids and our spouse need to know that they are loved. And if they know they are loved, we are getting out of the dysfunction of life. And our spouse and our kids are valued. Are valued. You did a good job today. When, 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 when you shot that shot, although you, you went one for 20, that one shot you made was really good. We have to show that they're valued. We have to lift them up. Sometimes our kids are torn down, deflated, because mom and dad point out the one thing they have done wrong instead of the things that they have done right. And sometimes it deflates them. But we need to value them. You know, maybe it's just me, but I doubt it. I'm more spiritual than you. But maybe it's just me. But... Uh, I don't want to be held to my worst day. I don't want my image and my self-worth to be held to the worst day that I've had. Because the worst day that I've had is not a good day. But God forgave me of that day. And I am not bound to the dysfunction, to the failures of my past. God values me. God values you. So when we look through the lens of value, we need to turn that around and say, I'm going to value you. I'm going to forgive you. There shouldn't be a marriage, a family in here that doesn't say, I was wrong. I forgive you. And when somebody says, I was wrong and I forgive you, what happens? I, 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 it's hard to say, but I was wrong too. And forgive me. What happens? is the eggshells start going off the floor. We don't worry about anger. All we have is tenderness and emotion and compassion because we value each other. And then they're recognized for their achievements. And I like this part. We as parents, spouse, we should be our spouses and our kids' greatest cheerleaders. Even if it's a D, as long as they did their best for that D, praise Jesus for the D. I, I had a couple of those kids. I'm, okay, you passed. Praise Jesus. Okay, thank God for that. Let's, 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 let's celebrate the achievements. Let's be the biggest cheerleaders they can be. When your spouse does something right, great job. When they do something for you, thank you. What happens when we are negative to our spouse, we're negative to our kids, what happens naturally, not that we want this to happen, but we pout. Anybody pout? We pout in different ways, don't we? But we pout. Our kids pout. Our spouse pouts. 
because we don't affirm them the way they need to be affirmed. We need to recognize their achievements and say, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for everything that you've done for me. And they are appreciated. To be a good enough family means this. Thanks for doing the dishes. Thanks for cleaning the house. Thanks for bringing home the paycheck. <laughs> thanks for cooking. Just thanks. You know, to give affirmation out doesn't cost you anything, but it gains everything. It doesn't cost you anything to say thanks. It may cause humility. So, I want to give you a couple of things. Parents maintain an environment where family members are physically and emotionally safe. That's our job. That I protect my spouse and my kids physically and emotionally. If our dysfunction causes hatred and animosity, like, like Esau said to Jacob, I'm going to kill you, what happens is there's no safety. And we need to make sure that our homes are a safe environment. And we can do that, dads, can't we? We have our conceal and carry, and we're very protective. If somebody comes to my door, I'm going to be the first one there. Well, at my house, my dog's going to be the first one there. You're going to have to get by Cujo, and then you can get to me. But we want that safe environment. But here's where it's hard. I know I'm going long, but I, I, this is very important. Is our home to not be dysfunctional, we have to be open. What does that mean? Can you talk? Can you share your opinions? Don't have to argue about everything. Parents model conflict resolution. We don't yell about everything. Because if you yell about everything, you're not gonna be heard about anything, right? Anybody who grew up in a yelling home? Ooh, flip that switch. Put that hearing aid. Let me turn that down. Al has a hearing aid. So this is funny. When, when I'm on staff meeting and I talk to him, he just does this. He just turns the hearing aid off. He just turns it off. He don't want to listen to me anyway. And sometimes I feel like that's what our families and our kids do, isn't it? And they may not actually have a hearing aid, but you could just see in their eyes, they just say, click. I don't care what you say. I'm going to flip the switch and I'm going to do what I want to do because you're going to yell at me if I do something right you're going to yell at me if I do something wrong so you're going to yell anyway so I might as well do what I want to do or what about open communication say I don't think you should do this why is that well because when I was 16 I did that same thing and it didn't turn out so good so instead of getting mad and yelling about what they did we should talk about the consequences of what you did and how it ruined your life. And maybe you could talk to them some sense. And be completely open and honest. There's no physical violence. Domestic abuse is rampant. It's rampant. And if we have domestic abuse in our home. Whether it's physical, emotional, mental. What we must do is we must talk to God about our fears. And our failures. And our sin. Sometimes in our society today. It is so overwhelming about abuse, physical, mental, and emotional abuse, that it is overwhelming. And our families are in chaos because mom and dad, we are in chaos. So how do we handle that? It's okay to be angry. In your family, being angry is not necessarily a sin. It's how you handle your anger. If we can't fly off the handle every time something happens. I, I could tell you stories about my dad flying off the handle and scared to death to walk in the door. I walked in the door one day and I saw my dad. They were frying ham. Back in the day, we fried everything back in the 80s, right? I mean, everything was fried. Fried potatoes, fried chicken, fried everything. My dad had ham and it was good stuff. My dad got mad at my mom one day and he was cooking something. He took that fried pan and he just threw it across the living room at the wall right beside my mom's face. And I walked in there and said, man, I was scared of my dad. Now I love my dad and I love my mom and I love my siblings. I think they're misfits, but they're mine, right? I love them, but I was scared. And I came to a point in my life, I decided 
I love my dad, but I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want my kids scared of me. I want my kids to love me and respect me, not because they have to, but because they want to. So how do I get to that step? It could be clumsy, and it could be awkward, but it's necessary. Let me give you a couple things as I'm trying to land the plane. This is touch and go time here. I need to admit my brokenness. I need to admit that it's okay to be bad. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to have issues because God loves me. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. This is my ah ah moment, and I hope it's yours too. I need to admit some things. I listed a few. I need to admit that I'm controlling. Some of us need to admit that I'm an alcoholic. I have issues with favoritism. I get angry, and when I get angry, it gets nasty. Somebody give me an amen, right? I never admit that I'm wrong. I'm addicted to pornography. I have things in my life that I try to hide. I'm embarrassed. I am wrong. The Bible says God forgives all sin. But what we must do is confess. Our job is to confess. His job is to forgive. Then we must repent. But until we confess, be self-aware and say, I have some personal issues. Ask God for help and direction. Ask God to change your life. I challenge you, I challenge you to be the person to break the cycle. You may be dealing with past issues, but you have the opportunity to say it stops with me. It stops at my house, with my kids, for my future grandkids. Let's put the right things in the right perspective. People who come to be dysfunctional families are not destined to be dysfunctional. You can break the cycle. You can do it. I'm not perfect by any means, and I'd never be the one to do it. But there was a day that I saw my dad throw that frying pan. There was a day that I watched the police officers arrest my brother. There's a day that I heard my brother committed rape. And there's a day that I heard my brother died. And I said, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't deserve to be your pastor, but I don't want to be dysfunctional. And I had to make a decision. That day, that was not going to be me. My family was chaotic. But my Lord is awesome. And all it took was for somebody to make a decision. And decisions are hard. They're awkward. They're messy. But they're needed. See, we live in this easy life. This deja vu. Well, when I wake up tomorrow, it'll be better. No, it won't. You can't wake up next week and it'll be better unless you wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to be better. I'm going to work on some things. This invitation should be packed today because we all have things we need to work on. We all have dysfunctions. We all sometimes are bad parents and bad spouses and bad people. But the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive. We need God's forgiveness. And after we receive God's forgiveness, let's be self-aware. Sometimes the biggest dysfunction in your home is spelled with three letters. You know what those three letters are? Y-O-U. It's me. I can't deal with my wife. I can't deal with my kids. 
the only person I can change is Bruce. That's what I've got to do. If you're tired of the dysfunction, the chaos, and the sin, the Bible says confess it, which means be self-aware. Maybe there's a reason why your spouse and you fight every day. Maybe there's a reason why your kids don't like you. Maybe there's a reason why chaos happens with you every stinking day. And don't look at your kids and don't look at your spouse. Look at you. Ask God to work with you. Ask God to be honest with you. To be self-aware. And I guarantee you, we won't have to have sermons on dysfunctional families every other week if we start fixing the dysfunction. And then at the bottom line, at the bottom line, we can start growing. We can start having happiness. We can get rid of the eggshells off the floor. We can look at our spouse, look at our kids, and look at our church eye to eye and say, let's talk. Let's change the destiny. Let's change our future. Because today we're making a decision. I will never forget the day I walked into that kitchen and my mom was crying and that frying pan was against the wall and grease all over the wall. And I could see the fear in my mom's eyes and the anger in my dad's eye. And I was probably 12 years old and I made a decision. I'm scared of him. And I also said something else. I don't ever want to be like him. I don't. And I've never thrown a frying pan. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. But there has to be a decision. We can have our chaos and have our dysfunction. It doesn't mean we have to be dysfunctional. It means we have to deal with where we are. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you as we sing this song to be self-aware. There's no masks. It's not being hypocritical. It's being honest. You may need to take your spouse and your kids and even yourself and come to the altar and say, Lord, I need your help. I do not want to be the cause of the future dysfunction of my family. Today, it stops. Today, it changes. Today is my day to change the future. Dear Father, Lord, be with us today. Dysfunction is real, and we all have it. And you said you can forgive it and you can give us peace and hope and the ability to get over it. And Lord, we need that. We have to have that. As a husband, a wife, a child, I need to look at myself because I am the cause of some dysfunction within my home. And Lord, forgive me for that and deal with my life. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. We're going to sing this song. The altars are open. There's no judging. Everybody has it. The question is, will we deal with it? And that's what I'm asking you to do today. Be self-aware and deal with your issues. Because that's the only time God will absolutely change your life. Let's sing this song. For I spoke a word you were singing over me. so so good to me before I took a breath and you breathed your life in me you have been so so couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, oh the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God.